Hello everyone, welcome. Thanks so much for joining us today for another installment of the research webinar series hosted by our team here at the Michigan Virtual Learning Research Institute or MVLRI. The goal of MVLRI is to expand Michigan's capacity to support new learning models, engage in active research to inform new policies in online and blended learning, and strengthen the state's infrastructures for sharing best practices. MVLRI is a division of MVU or the Michigan Virtual University, a nonprofit organization whose mission is advancing K-12 education through digital learning, research, innovation, policy, and partnerships. MVU is also the parent company of Michigan Virtual School, a supplemental state-sponsored virtual school, Michigan LearnPort, an online professional development portal for K-12 educators and personnel, and MyBlend, a blended learning initiative providing K-12 schools with resources, products, and services to personalize learning options for their students and improve student achievement. Before we introduce today's presenters and the topic of their presentation, an important disclaimer for our research webinar series. This webinar built, will be recorded publicly and shared publicly. Consequently, anything shared during this webinar, including chat comments, could be shared publicly. This webinar may represent a presenter's or an attendee's personal views, opinions, conclusions, and other information which do not necessarily reflect those of MVU and or the Michigan Virtual Learning Research Institute and are not given nor endorsed by MVU slash MVLRI unless otherwise specified. Today we have with us Dr. Michael Barber from Sacred Heart University and he will be presenting on the U.S. and international K-12 online learning and how they have developed differently. With that, I will hand it right on over to Dr. Michael Barber. Um, thank you, Justin. And uh, I see we've got a small group here and I recognize most of the names in the um, room. And since there's actually, other than the uh, Michigan Virtual Learning, uh, Research Institute folks, only about five folks here. Um, I might start off by just asking you sort of, you know, what it was that brought you to this session today because given the small number, um, I mean, I'm quite happily to go through the eight or nine slides that I've got here, but if there were things that you particularly came to find out about, um, I'd be more than happy to try to tailor things to them and really, you know, go off in a completely different direction if um, you know there's specific things that folks in the room would like would like me to cover I see a couple of people typing there now so I'll give you a minute or two to um, type in there as I'm doing that uh, one of the things I will mention is essentially that uh, this session today uh, I suspect is one in a series that Justin and Catherine and Kristen and uh, Rebecca and folks at the Institute have put together um, because I've noticed that a number of my colleagues who had chapters in the handbook um, that Catherine and Rick Ferdig edited uh, earlier this year, actually I say earlier this year, I think it might have even come out at the end of 2014 if I'm not mistaken. I don't have the uh, the copyright page in front of me here now. Um, so I can't check that, but um, basically what I'm going to talk about here today um, largely focuses upon the types of things that um, came about from my particular chapter in the handbook, which is the, uh, the second chapter. I see Lorraine has added some stuff um, into the text box and um, I'm not sure if I'm going to touch on that much in the in what I had planned to talk about, Lorraine, but I'm sure that we can get around to it at the end, uh, which is um, interesting. Um, and Michelle, okay, uh, FLVS Global, um, and I know a couple of your colleagues, I believe, although the names aren't going to come to me off the top of my head now, but um, I know I've interacted with several folks down that way. Yes, Anne is one of those that, uh, actually I think she has reviewed this book, or maybe it was the one that Tom and I uh, wrote um, for one of the special issues that I'm, I'm currently editing. Um, anyway, so um, the focus of my session then is going to be largely upon what we have here in the, the chapter. Um, or what I have here in the chapter, I should say. And, you know, to, I guess, get us started, um, basically when Rick asked me to do this initially, 
uh, I actually hemmed and hawed about it. I, I was more than happy to do it because I think of all of the folks that are doing research into K-12 online learning, I'm probably the one that has done the most work outside of the United States. And it only seemed to make sense that I would write to this kind of, um, you know, what's happening elsewhere in the world kind of chapter. But it, it took me a long time to figure out how to go about doing this. And finally, after probably missing a couple of deadlines where I was supposed to have something, you know, a draft into Catherine and Rick, um, and not having a single word written yet, I remember having a conversation with Rick, and this is roughly what he said to me. And if for whatever reason, this was sort of, you know, my response to this question when he asked it of me verbally was where the idea for how we structured the chapter came about. And if you look at that structure, essentially what we decided to do, or what I decided to do with, you know, Rick and Catherine's, uh, you know, suggestion, was to look at this in terms of, you know, how are things that are happening in the U.S. similar to what we see going on internationally, and then how are things different uh, to what we see going internationally. So I guess to, to start off with that, oops, I missed a slide there. So yes, this is the beginning of the second chapter um, in the book, which in case you're going through, it begins on page 25 of the uh, text. So um, feel free to follow along. Anyway, so in response to Rick, and I think I misordered my slides there. I think the slide from Rick should have been uh, right before that um, chapter slide that you saw there. Um, but essentially, you know, there's a lot of things that we have that um, where there are a lot of consistency between what you see in the U.S. and internationally. And there are also a number of things that are quite different. And essentially, I, I put them down into, while I say a lot, I came up with what I felt was three commonalities between the two contexts and four main differences between them. So we'll start off with, with the consistencies, because this is probably the easier part to get through. It's also probably the quicker part to get through, in all honesty. Um, so there were sort of three main consistencies that I talk about in the chapter, and I'm going to go through and talk about each of these individually, giving some specific examples. But you can see them sort of summarized here um, based upon, and, and they roughly follow the section headings that you see in the chapter itself. So um, looking at this first one, um, the first consistency that I found was that the way in which K-12 distance education has evolved internationally is actually quite consistent with what we're familiar with in the United States. Um, you know, Tom Clark, who's sitting in the room here, if you've read his chapter in the Handbook of Distance Education, he does a great job at actually tracing the history of distance education in the U.S. to get to where we are today. And one of the things that he talks about <coughs> is the fact that, you know, this, at least for the, at the K-12 level, and the same is true at the higher ed level, began with a correspondence model of, of education. Um, in his chapter, Tom talks about, you know, really beginning, at least with the K-12 level, with an outreach program that was done at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Um, from there, we see some use of educational radio that starts to get happening. Um, specifically, you get, you know, the Ohio School from the Air and the Wisconsin School from the Air that were developed. Uh, you actually get some instructional television. Um, the one that Tom specifically references in his chapter is the Midwest program and airborne television instruction. And then you start getting into some of these early computer-based programs uh, like Plato 3. Um, there's a wonderful book that I'm trying to remember now, but I, I can see the cover over on my saw. On my bookshelf there, entitled Web-Based Learning. Um, by Bruner Horn, and I'm not even going to try to pronounce this last name, P-Y-T-L-I-K-Z or Z for my American reader or listeners, I-L-L-I-G. And essentially this was looking at a, um, a computer-based program that was implemented, if I remember correctly, it was also implemented in Nebraska. Um, and it was part of the class project, which was another one of those early, um, they weren't quite telematics programs, but they were computer-based distance ed programs. 
and then we get some video conferencing that's happening and then it brings us up to the online environment that we have today and when you look at other countries you know this is quite consistent the first distance ed programs in Canada were um, these correspondence based programs in British Columbia actually the first one started in 1919 um, and they were specifically actually set up to serve children who um, whose father I was going to say whose parents but it's really whose father was the lighthouse keeper along coastal BC particularly in the north um, even still to this day in New Zealand uh, we have the correspondence school or Takora um, that was set up in 1922 and you know, continues on right to this day and is actually still the largest provider of distance education in the United States or in uh, New Zealand, sorry. Um, when it comes to educational radio, we get a similar type thing. I mentioned, you know, in the U.S. it was the Ohio School of the Year and the Wisconsin School of the Year. Schools of the Year were actually quite popular in Australia and even three years ago there were still 20 of them in operation, uh, one of which was actually celebrating its 60th anniversary in that particular year because um, I remember featuring them on my blog um, again the use of, of computer-based distance education prior to the online environment uh, telematics was the way in which this was our audio graphics it's often called uh, the way it was operationalized in places like Canada particularly the Canadian province of Newfoundland uh, it was also used extensively in Australia and it's still used today and even the virtual program that's being used in um, New Zealand right now still uses a significant core component of it that focuses upon video conferencing. So this sort of history and development that we see um, to where we get today between the U.S. and Canada is quite considered between the U.S. and internationally, sorry, is quite consistent. Another thing that uh, is quite consistent is the use of state and federal funds, uh, particularly state or uh, sorry federal funds to create a lot of these early programs you know if you go back to um, here in, in the US as an example um, you know the virtual high school global consortium or virtual high school Inc or now it's VHS collaborative um, was initially set up with the federal star schools grant um, you know the Florida virtual school that Michelle is coming to us from was initially set up through a state grant uh, that was provided if I remember correctly it was 5.2 million and if I remember correctly the star schools grant to the virtual high school is 7.5 million Although I might have my numbers off a bit there um, you know and a lot of these other programs Michigan virtual was also set up by a state grant that was provided and I think you guys are in your 16th year now if I'm not mistaken uh, Justin Kristen and Rebecca um, I'm trying to do my math from the last time that I, I remember attending the conference you guys had when it was your 10th anniversary so I'm just trying to add up from the last one um, and this is actually quite consistent with what we see outside of the United States although in the outside of the US with the exception of Canada it actually tends to be federal funding that um, is where this pr primarily comes from so regardless if we're looking you know in, in um, you know Oceania or you know the Australia New Zealand uh, area or if we're looking at Europe when it comes to places like Turkey and Finland or in Asia with you know examples of the cyber home learning system you know or ScienceNet in Singapore these are all programs that were largely created based upon well not largely in most cases um, exclusively created based upon federal funding systems that were put in place the other thing that's quite consistent is for the most part, the terms that we use to describe um, K-12 online learning or K-12 online and blended learning tend to be quite consistent. And actually, I'll say mostly K-12 online learning in this respect because uh, when we get to blended learning, that's actually going to be one of the biggest differences that we find uh, when I get to that section of it. Um, but most places that you go, regardless of the nature of their program, you can usually talk about a program being full-time or supplemental. You can usually talk about it being face-to-face, um, -face, term they would often use is hybrid or online. So, you know, online, face-to-face -face, or some combination of the two. Um, looking at the geographic reach of a program, so a program that is district-wide or province-wide 
or nationwide, and in many instances outside of the U.S., um, particularly outside of the U.S. and Canada, it tends to be nationwide. And then that idea of locus of control, you know, at what level is it controlled at? So if you look at, um, you know, Michigan Virtual as, as a good example, um, while it's not part of the Department of Education, it's, you know, an arm's length agency that um, is directly funded by the Department of Education, actually directly funded in many instances directly by the legislature. Um, you know, whereas other ones say, again, to keep in the Michigan uh, context, if you were to look at the um, Westwood Cyber School is actually run by the Westwood uh, Community Schools District. Uh, you know, so that if it's being done by a board or a district compared to being done often directly or indirectly from a Department of Education. And you get that kind of thing happening outside of the U.S. as well. Um, so probably where I guess most of the um, conversation, and when I've done this type of presentation in the past, um, even before the chapter was created, uh, this is where I tended to spend most of my time is looking at the differences because, you know, in all honesty, it, it's one thing to say, okay, yeah, some of these things have developed and are described in similar ways, but it's really the differences where I think it becomes interesting. And there are four main differences that we do have. Um, and I'll go through each of these in order here now. But uh, the first one is that unlike the U.S. where there are primarily online or blended programs and there are very few programs that look at these legacy delivery models uh, within once you leave the United States the use of these legacy or previous technologies to deliver distance education is still quite prevalent not only is it quite prevalent but in all honesty um, in many instances it's the way in which the majority of students get their online learning. So if you look at, say, for example, in New Zealand with uh, Takura, the, the correspondence school, you know, as of two years ago, there were 14,000 students that were enrolled in courses through this particular program. That's, well, uh, basically it's 10 times the number of students that were enrolled through the virtual learning network that was available throughout the country as well. Uh, there were about 14 to 1600 kids that were enrolled in one of the e-learning clusters as part of the virtual learning network whereas there were 14,000 students enrolled in one or more courses through the correspondence school similarly and you know it's not just because you know a country may be rural and remote and not necessarily have you know high speed ac internet access all throughout the country which in all honesty does kind of describe lots of New Zealand um, at least you know, at the time that this particular statistic was taken two years ago before their network for learning uh, was created and they started, um, you know, bringing high-speed internet to a lot of the schools, although many of them are still um, not well connected. But even if you look at Canada as a good example, uh, you know, the industrial province of Ontario um, still has approximately two-thirds of the students that take distance ed courses in that province, take them through the Independent Learning Centre, uh, which is a correspondence-based unit. Um, almost all of the elementary distance education that's provided in any province in Canada is done through correspondence as opposed to being in an online format. Um, as I mentioned, you know, it was only three or four years ago that there were 20 schools of the year that were still in operation. Uh, when I looked it up about, I guess it was 10 months ago when we were finalizing this particular chapter, there were still 15 of those that were in operation. And oddly enough, there were still six programs in Australia that were using the old telematics or audiographic system uh, that had been available since the late 70s and early 80s. So uh, actually, Australia is sort of a real interesting example in this because it, you can almost always tell when a, a region of the country began offering distance education based upon how their program is being delivered because for many of them they bought heavily into a particular type of technology uh, when they first created their program and they've just continued to maintain and update and upgrade that particular program and never having gotten rid of that type of technology um, so you know those programs that typically began prior to 1970-75 typically were schools of the air those that started in the late 70s right up to the mid to late 80s 
that are using telematics as a system still. Um, you know, those that started in the 90s are the ones that tend to be online right now. One of the things, and, and depending upon who ends up in my audience, I either always get total agreement or general pushback on this point. Um, but in all honesty, I mean, you have to be living under a rock or just totally unwilling to admit the obvious. And this is why Justin has that second slide up front when he tells people that, um, you know, these aren't necessarily the opinions of Michigan Virtual. Um, to deny the, not just the influence, but in all honesty, the, the general reliance of folks within the K-12 online learning industry to rely upon free market advocates to push the uh, envelope and to push the number and nature of online and blended programs that are available to students throughout the United States. Um, like I say, it's an undeniable fact, um, although there are many people within the field that, that would deny it, um, you know, and they can continue living under a rock like so many folks do on so many issues that face American society. But, um, you know, the undeniable truth is that when it comes to K-12 online learning, in some respects, you know, advances have been made because of these uh, free market proponents. But in many instances, they've actually put the field back. Um, at least in terms of its acceptance and in terms of good pedagogy, good instructional design, and good practice. Outside of the United States, even in countries where there is the application of free market principles on most aspects of the education environment, places like England, places like Australia, you do not tend to see the presence of free market advocates within the K-12 distance education space. Um, you know, to use Canada as an example, there is only one province in Canada that allows for charter schools and that's been the case now for well over a decade and even with all of the pressures that you see in the United States towards the cyber charter movement, there has never really been any talk whatsoever of creating a cyber charter school in uh, the province of Alberta. Um, you know, England, which, you know, is as much over the moon about free market principles and Adam Smith being the savior of public education, much like um, the folks in the United States. Again, you see online learning in the UK is really nascent at this point. Um, you know, and I think one of the things that, you know, you're seeing because of that is, is that it's a much more collaborative environment once you leave the U.S., so, you know, as I state here, you know, there are five particular jurisdictions that I use as examples where you're seeing government forces and corporations that are coming together in partnership um, for the larger, greater good with, in many instances, the corporations primarily being contractors for services as opposed to being folks that directly run um, opportunities for K-12 distance education. One of the outcomes, I think, of that absence of those free market advocates within the K-12 distance education space is the fact that, in all honesty, there is very little proliferation of K-12 distance education beyond the secondary environment when you um, leave the U.S., uh, particularly online learning. As I mentioned earlier, uh, Correspondence education is almost exclusively used for elementary school students in Canada, and those students have to do that on a full-time basis. Essentially, for them, it's a, a, a true alternative to homeschooling because um, the parent basically is still the teacher in these environments, and all they do is receive a booklet of materials that they have to cover with their child that comes from the Department of Education or comes from a particular school district. Now, some would argue that our cyber charter schools in many respects are nothing more than glorified homeschooling, and I would be one of those people. Um, in fact, I've done entire presentations on that fact, and I know at least three people in the room here have sat through one of those presentations at some point in time. Um, you know, but even when, for example, um, the virtual school 
and College Educational Initiative, which is this v VISED uh, project in Europe that Paul Bash was in charge of. Uh, when they were looking for online programs, based upon their review of what was going on in the world, they focused their entire initiative on programs that were designed for students aged 14 to 21, so essentially late middle school up through early uh, university. And that's because when they started looking around the world, with the exception of the United States, there was very little activity that was going on uh, when it came to online learning outside of the high school level. And, and and with the exception of those cyber charter schools that I've I've mentioned several times, um, there's also very little activity for online learning for uh, middle school and elementary students going on. Um, you know, the Michigan virtual folks, I'm sure, would be able to confirm this. When you look at the number of courses that they offer at the high school level, at the middle school level, um, I'm willing to bet that it's at least a 10 to 1, maybe even as high as 15 to 1 ratio in terms of the number of courses for each of those levels. Um, and I'm assuming that Michigan Virtual School doesn't offer any uh, elementary school level courses uh, that students can take. Um, you know, the, the folks from Michigan Virtual can correct me if I'm wrong here, but uh, I think I'm right in those numbers because I think that would be consistent with most other programs. Um, you know, one of the only the exceptions to that might be uh, Michelle's Florida Virtual School, although even then they contract with a, um, a main provider of cyber charter schools, uh, Connections Education, to be the ones to provide their elementary school options. Um, as a online program itself, FLVS, uh, you know, if you were to take away this subcontractor, um, really doesn't do much outside of the high school space either. That's consistent across the board. The third one that, uh, the third difference that um, I want to talk about is the term blended learning. Uh, this is an interesting one because in all honesty, when you look outside of the United States, um, A, you see that they are doing a lot of blended learning, but no one's calling it that. Um, you know, so I always look at, you know, the iNACL descriptions because this is always, I find, quite interesting. Um, you know, iNACL in their recent definitions project um, defined blended learning based upon the description that you see up above. Three or four years ago when they were doing their international study uh, looking at, you know, what was going on in the field of online learning and, and when they did the study, they were specifically looking for the field of online learning. Um, you know, in that, they used this to describe online learning. So in the survey that was sent out to each of the um, ministries or departments of education around the world, this was the description that they used to describe online learning. Um, a range of web-based resources, media tools, and interactivity, and curricular or instructional approaches. Now, if you're doing all of that in a face-to-face -face environment, that sounds pretty much exactly like what their definition of blended learning is, if you ask me. Um, you know, and it's interesting because depending on where you go, you'll hear it called different things. Um, you know, so if you're in many countries that are part of the Commonwealth, um, so particularly Europe and Canada, they'll use the term information and communications technologies. And that's their code for basically any type of learning that deals with technology from, you know, the guy who's using PowerPoint in his classroom or using an electronic whiteboard or, for that matter, using the old overhead projector to the far end of the spectrum where we're delivering everything online. Um, they don't see online learning and particularly blended learning as something different. It's just something on this continuum of technology integration. Um, as I mentioned there, you know, New Zealand and a lot of the Asian countries in particular will use the term e-learning as their sort of catch-all term for that continuum that we're talking about. Uh, it's really only here in the U.S. where we actually talk about face-to-face -face learning, blended learning, and online learning like they're three kind of separate things. Um, now, I happen to think that that goes back to that idea of, of those free market proponents because, you know, if you're trying to show the strength of a movement, the more people that you can include in that movement, 
the better off it looks. So if you're including, you know, just those folks that are learning online in that movement, that's one number. If you're including all of those folks that are learning in a blended and online format, it includes a much larger number, which means things look much better for you. Um, and Tom is actually getting a little bit ahead of me here now, um, but my next line was going to be, you know, and if you use the term digital learning, like the folks at Keeping Pace have decided to use uh, this year, um, show me too many teachers in the United States right now that aren't doing some form of digital learning. And I'll show you, you know, a small proportion of teachers that just don't want to get with the program. Um, you know, I would say that 90% of the teachers in the United States right now are doing some form of digital learning with their students. And that being the case, I guess, you know, Horn, Christensen, and Johnson's uh, belief that 50% of all education will be delivered in online or blended formats. You notice the first edition of the book, it just said online. Um, recent editions have you know revised that but again if you start bringing in more and more things into your definition all of a sudden you can claim you know not just a small little thing that's going on but a groundswell of movement that's happening um, so I think that's probably part of the reason but one of the big differences is that you know the term blended learning or at least seeing it as something separate from classroom based instruction um, really doesn't exist once you leave the United States. Um, because we're familiar with what goes on in the U.S. literature, they'll know what it is, uh, but it's not a term that's that's regularly used. Um, you know, as the title of the slide says, it's seen, blended learning is just seen as a part of this sort of regime of effective technology integration. Um, so one of many things that you could use. So that's basically the nature of my um, you know summary I guess of the similarities and differences um, depending upon again like I say the audience that I get in some cases um, folks generally agree with me in other cases they want to throw things at me so I always leave lots of time to have uh, conversations when it comes to this kind of topic because depending upon who I've got here um, we might get folks from either end of the spectrum and I'm happy to to defend anything that I just said. I want to let folks know too that um, if you're interested in participating through voice rather than typing something in the chat box, uh, just indicate so by raising your hand uh, in the attendee list there or type something in the chat window. We'd be more than happy since we've got a small group to engage in some, uh, some voice conversation too. Michael, I have a question for you. Um, would you say in any way that the U.S. has been maybe seeing some lessons learned from other countries and the way that they have structured maybe their policy or some of their practices around online learning? Or would you say that we are kind of unique in, in the way that we do things, especially from the aspect of the, the free market side of things? I'm kind of glad I had my mic muted when you started to ask that question because as you started, I actually started laughing. Um, I, I can honestly say that not only do I not believe that the U.S. has actually learned anything from um, their international uh, counterparts when it comes to uh, at particularly policy and regulation, I don't even think they've learned much from each other. Um, you know, all you need to do is look at the nature of, say, regulation around full-time online learning in states like Pennsylvania and Ohio, both of which have been at this, you know, since really 1999-2000. And you can see how poor uh, an opportunity that students have to achieve in these kinds of environments. 
Um, if I remember correctly, last time in Ohio, there wasn't a single online program that was actually meeting AYP, and this was a consistent, asp you know, consistent uh, finding from year to year. What happened three years ago in Michigan? Well, basically, they set up a regulatory regime when it came to full-time programs that's not unlike what you see in Ohio and Pennsylvania. Um, you know, whereas prior to uh, 2006, you know, Michigan actually had a pretty decent, uh, you know, regulatory and policy uh, regime uh, when it came to the way in which it um, it supported and, and offered online learning. And even in its original legislation that came into effect in 2006 was actually, I won't say good, but it, it was still a step in the right direction. Um, but yet, you know, all it takes is, is a bit of lobbying, a bit of money, and um, a bunch of um, legislatures who, you know, unfortunately in the U.S., and this is consistent across so many states, um, because we've put in place term limits on many of these folks, the second that they end up learning anything about the stuff that they're actually passing laws on, they're term limited out, and we get a bunch of other rookies in there that don't know what they're doing and continue to make the same mistakes that... Uh, you know, legislators in the past have made. So, um, no, I think in all honesty, in the U.S., um, it really is the proponents of that sort of those free market principles that are driving the show when it comes to the policy and regulation that's put in place state by state. Um, to the second part of your question, uh, are folks from outside, you know, internationally actually, you know, noticing what's happening and learning from what's going on in, in the U.S. And I would say that that is actually uh, probably a little bit more accurate a statement. I think one of the biggest reasons why you haven't seen cyber charter schools um, come around in Alberta is because of the incredibly poor performance, the high level of um, financial and other administrative irregularities that come about, um, you know, and, um, you know, because of that, I think you've, people in um, Alberta just haven't had an appetite for that kind of thing. In fact, uh, the only two times it's even ever been written about in the province, uh, one by the Alberta Teachers Federation, uh, or Alberta Teachers Association, sorry, and the other time by uh, a funding agency called the uh, Parkland Institute, um, both times they actually used uh, extensively the American experience as a rationale for why they'd want to stay away from that kind of thing in the province of Alberta. I see Tom's question in the um, chat box, and as I'm hoping other folks might chime in with their thoughts, I did want to sort of contextualize my comment about glorified homeschooling. Um, folks that are unfamiliar with cyber charters may or may not know this, but the way in which essentially they are set up is while there is a teacher that is in theory responsible for some aspect of the instruction, so they are to some extent teacher-led courses, their instructional model relies upon the fact that the primary instructional role is provided by the learning coach. Now the learning coach is a parent or a guardian in most instances, um, and in most of those instances, the teacher essentially is available as a grader and an on-demand tutor. Um, now there are some programs, and I'm generalizing here obviously, because uh, there are some programs where the teachers are much more active in nature, but you can usually tell which programs those are. Uh, those that have a student-teacher ratio that is somewhat consistent with what we see in the supplemental environment, which in most cases is fairly consistent with what we see in the face-to-face -face environment, those full-time online programs tend to be much more teacher-focused, uh, much more teacher-led, if you will, uh, whereas those that have student-to-teacher ratios that are two and three, in some cases four times the number that we typically see in the face-to-face -face environment, 
let's face it, in those environments, the teacher is nothing more than a grader and an on-demand tutor. And given the automization and standardization of most of these programs, there's very little grading that um, that is actually occurring in those kind of environments, which essentially means that the um, teacher is basically an on-demand tutor. And, and again, I'm generalizing, although in all honesty, I would suggest that that captures the uh, essence of most of the full-time statewide programs that are offered by the two corporate providers that we have available in the U.S. Um, not sure if others want to chime in on it or if Tom had some thoughts on his question. I note that Lorraine and Michelle have been kind of quiet. Did you two have any other questions? Because as I mentioned, I've worked with Jason and Tom in the past. So, um, you know, they've they've heard these rants a few times. Um, in Jason's case, probably a few too many times, um, given that he was a student of mine. But uh, I didn't know if you guys had any questions on the topic. Actually, uh, thanks for that reminder, Tom. Uh, I'll start with that one, and then I'll come back to yours, Lorraine, because your second question is actually an interesting one when you look at it from an international perspective as well. Um, but strategies and best practices for collaborative learning, uh, at least when I look outside of the United States, um, the one that comes to mind the most, in all honesty, is that you see, and I don't have it as one of the main differences in the paper, although I could have, is there is a greater reliance upon synchronous instruction when you leave the United States. Um, as I mentioned in a couple of the slides, many of these programs are run directly through the federal government or the national government in those pro uh, jurisdictions. So because of that, and even when you look at the Canadian provinces, uh, any of the programs that are being run by or at arm's length from the Ministry of Education are being run you know, at least at the level of uh, where the regulation for education would take place. Uh, so because of that, they're actually able to require a lot more synchronous instruction. And in all honesty, some of the best uh, examples of synchronous pra or of uh, collaborative practice that I've seen uh, come out of those synchronous sessions. Um, New Zealand is actually an interesting case study in this respect. Uh, the virtual learning networks that um, they have their, um, these are regionally based or geographically based networks, although they're starting to combine more and more now, so the geography is getting a little bit bigger. But once a term, they will come together in what they call an e-hui. Uh, hui is the, the Maori word for meeting um, or gathering, actually. And so all of the teachers and all of the students, uh, one of the days at the beginning of the term, often actually the first day or uh, just before the term begins, will come together in a face-to-face -face sitting to get to know each other and to um, essentially meet their classmates and meet their teacher. The rest of their time, they will spend essentially one out of every five classes, uh, and they have five one-hour classes every week. 
Um, so they will spend one of their five classes each week in a video conferencing session. Um, and then the other four hours each week is done in an asynchronous format. And um, because they've got that synchronous aspect that's built in uh, so that at least once a week for 20% of the instruction, you know, that synchronous nature allows for the community building to take place. Um, so I think that's actually one of the things um, that I find tremendously uh, important and, and that I see even in programs that are primarily asynchronous. It surprises me the number of sessions that they will attempt to set up to allow folks to come together. And the cyber charter schools, you know, for everything I'll say negative about them, one of the things that I think they do do quite well are these field trips and outings and co-curricular activities where, you know, they'll organize them around the state for students that are in that part of the state or that are willing to make that the drive to that location can come together and all the teachers that are located in that part of the state are there. So again, it's a way of just coming together. Um, so I think that's actually one of the, the things that, in all honesty, I'd like to see K-12 online programs do, even the, the supplemental ones. Um, you know, it would be easy enough in most states to, you know, carve up the state into eight or ten sort of geographic areas and to, you know, once a year or once a semester to actually host an event, um, you know, and you can have it co-curricular in nature, you could have it, you know, not co-curricular in nature, just a, a fun type of thing to bring folks together so that they can, um, you know, interact with each other and get to know each other a little bit better and get to know who their teacher is and, you know, so that they can understand that it's not just a, a name uh, on a screen, but there's a face behind that name as well. Um, one of the other things that uh, I've seen internationally that I think when it comes to collaboration, um, one of the programs in New Zealand, uh, Wellcom, um, which is one of the, the e-learning clusters there, just, it's actually located in the Warawapa War region, of um, New Zealand, which is just um, just outside of Wellington, uh, so just outside the capital on the other side of the Rimatakas, uh, which is a big mountain range that sort of cuts the two areas. Um, and in the War Rapa, what uh, ends up happening, uh, Wellcom is actually, by U.S. standards, we would actually describe it more as a blended program than an online program. They describe it as an e-learning program because e-learning encompasses blended learning. Um, but their program is actually quite worth looking at um, in terms of, of that uh, collaborative aspect because uh, it's actually one of the most interesting ones I, I've, I've seen in the country. Um, to the other question you asked about higher ed practices, um, one of the things that uh, I've seen outside of the United States that I think could translate in at least in higher ed for the purposes of teacher preparation for K-12 online learning is that um, there are jurisdictions that have been well ahead of the game when it comes to creating specific programs for online learning. Um, as early as actually 1999, uh, Memorial University of Newfoundland had a, um, uh, a degree program. It was an undergraduate diploma, diploma sorry, uh, 15 actually I think 15 credit hour diploma that they had in rural education and telelearning is the term that they used. Um, and we still see, you know, Canada, um, you know, Ontario were, was the first jurisdiction in North America to have endorsements for, uh, they use the term e-learning. Uh, so teaching and learning with e-learning is the additional qualification or uh, that you can get in Ontario uh, related to this. And, uh, you know, this predated uh, jurisdictions like Idaho and uh, Georgia and, to a lesser extent, Michigan, who have created either online learning endorsements or, in the case of Michigan, the Red Tech endorsement is about two-thirds focused upon online learning. Um, you know, so those are some particular examples. Uh, I also think that there are a number of the smaller regional schools in British Columbia that are doing some interesting things with their online learning diplomas um, that I think higher ed communities in the United States would be uh, well worth looking at, particularly those that are looking at starting their own graduate diplomas or graduate certificates in online or K-12 online learning. 
Um, you know, folks like Victoria Island University and Thompson Rivers University, I think, are doing some uh, really creative things with how they've put together their diplomas for online learning uh, that they've created. The University of Canterbury in New Zealand actually has an endowed research chair who is focuses specifically upon e-learning. Uh, those of us in the community know her quite well. Um, Nikki Davis, who used to be at Iowa State University, was the person who was uh, hired into that particular position. All right, well, thank you so much, Michael, for an incredibly informative presentation. Uh, thanks to all of our attendees uh, who submitted some good questions. Tom, thanks for kind of running point and, uh, and adding in some additional comments and questions there, too. We really appreciate uh, all of your insights uh, from both of you. Oh, did want to finish with Michael's contact info there on the very last page. Be sure to check out both of his websites especially his incredibly helpful blog, virtualschooling.wordpress.com. We wanted to point you to a couple of ongoing MVLRI initiatives before wrapping up as well. We have uh, an ongoing podcast series called Virtual Viewpoints, where we sit down with folks who are uh, working in the realm of K-12 online and blended learning here in the States, uh, all across the country, not just here in Michigan. And we try to get a feel for how research informs their work and uh, what role research actually plays uh, and helping to drive the field as a whole forward. We have um, a former guest of our podcast, Michelle Licata, here in the audience today. So uh, we encourage you to click that link and check out her episode as well as others. Uh, and if you're interested in sharing your own work uh, in the realm of online and blended and, and how research informs that work, please reach out to me. Uh, I'll include my email in the chat box and we'd be happy to uh, talk about having you on as a guest as well. If you are interested in writing for us, we have a guest blogger program. So you can click the link there to learn more about our guest blogger program initiative. Um, learn about uh, the audience that we're writing for and a little bit more of the details on how that guest blogger program works. And we do want to encourage you to attend our upcoming event designed specifically for researchers. We have our quarterly research collaborative meeting. This will be our summer meeting. Uh, it will be taking place next Tuesday, June 30th at 2 p.m. Eastern. And we'll be uh, hosting this space uh, as a place for researchers to come together and get feedback on their own work and then share opportunities for collaborations on grants, research, publications, etc. Our senior researcher, Catherine Kennedy, is the point person for that uh, meeting as well. So if you have any questions, if you don't already have her contact information, I'd be happy to relay those questions to you or to her and uh, she'll be running that meeting as well. So uh, we hope to see all of you working in the research areas uh, at that meeting. 
In the meantime, please feel free to reach out to us, offer us feedback on the webinar series and any of our other initiatives at mvlri at mivu.org. You can sign up for our mailing list by clicking the link there where we uh, send notifications about upcoming webinars, uh, podcasts, blog posts, all of the things that we put out as an institute here. And then you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Our handles are listed as well as our LinkedIn page. Our YouTube channel, where we post the recordings of our webinars. You can expect to see the recording of this webinar up by tomorrow as well. And our webinars page on our mvlri.org site, where you can see all of our upcoming scheduled webinars as well. I want to thank Michael again so much for presenting today. Thank you all for coming out, and I hope everyone has a great week. Take care.